Hey people, welcome back to another video by your favorite Parliamento gatekeeper. And that's going to be an episode about a tiny modulation pattern that I'm going to extract from Schumann's Chopin. Although Chopin was very obviously using that thing as well, I wouldn't say that Schumann was aiming for an outright quotation. The thing is that this device can actually be traced back well into the 18th century where it was already used by guys like Mozart. But not just that, I would say that it even can be related to a very common 18th century teaching device that we today refer to as rule of the octave. So that's gonna be a rich episode. Let's go! Schumann's Carnival is a compilation of 20-something short pieces that form some sort of masquerade made of musical miniatures portraying fantastic and real-life figures, such as his alter egos and, of course, the girls. You may have heard that the young Schumann was, to put it mildly, well, kind of a lady killer. And for sure was a threat to female aristocratic piano students. But we're going astray here. What I was about to tell you is that in his carnival there were as well two portraits of other composers. The first one is Paganini and the other one is, wait for it, Chopin. Although I already knew for a long time that this piece existed, I never really had it on the map. So one day once again I stumbled upon this piece on this record and eventually got hooked. Although I must say I just kinda didn't really get it at all, as apart from the choice of key, I couldn't quite see the Chopin relation. But for a few days I was downright obsessed with that piece and this was primarily due to that beautiful opening phrase. Let's give it a quick listen. To me the most striking feature is that Schumann is drifting away from the tonic right away by tonicizing B flat minor, which provides a very dreamy, almost hallucinatory atmosphere. It's particularly the way how he's doing that, by approaching its dominant via stepwise motion from above with a sonority that seems very special. So instead of just throwing in the secondary dominant to B flat minor, he's using that very specific predominant, which makes the modulation more of an eventful situation. And the original passage again. Well, Chopin actually could be named as a fan of this type of modulation as well. As a given example, let's check out the first page of the famous A-flat study from Opus 25, where he's using a very similar device two times successively to initiate key changes. As far as I know from Schumann's letters, this is one of the pieces Chopin performed for Schumann in Leipzig in a private session, and especially that piece made a certain impression on him. Let's listen in now, and after that we're gonna check out the harmonic reduction. reduction I changed the voice leading of the soprano a little bit to make the similarity of the situations more visible. First the 6-5-1 to F minor coming right from D flat and directly after that the 6-5-1 to E flat, which is as well the 5 of the initial home key as it holds as well a 7th, but it's important to understand that both situations are exactly of the same modularity. Now is it actually possible that Schumann was maybe aiming for a direct reference to Chopin within a piece that seems to mimic Chopin's compositional habits not just in key and texture but as well by applying this specific modulation pattern? 
highly unlikely, as it actually was used to its full poetic potential already in the 18th century, which I'm gonna prove with two very beautiful examples by Wolfi. The first one is from the slow movement of the well-known Sonata Facile. Let's listen in. Right after the cadence, he's striving for C minor via that sixth chord just like in the initial Schumann example, and I'd say the effect and sound is pretty similar. As I said at the beginning, that modulation pattern can actually be related to a crucial teaching device that was commonly used in 18th and 19th century composer's apprenticeship all over Europe, as this thing is supposed to teach the most common chord progressions upon stepwise bass motions, there was always a version to internalize that descends through the whole minor scale. If we go back to the original Mozart example, you can see that after the key change, he literally follows the rule of the octave, stepwise motion in the bass going along with the exact chords I just showed you. It's not like Mozart did stumble upon this device by accident, he didn't just learn it himself, he actually taught it as well to his own students, as you can see on this page that's taken from an edition of his teaching materials. Depending on what source you may consult, you'll find a simple 6th chord or the more dissonant half diminished 4-3 chord above the descending 6th degree. So the progression from 6 to 5 can be and actually was used as a 2 chord module that you can insert at a certain point. For example, when you want to switch keys. Here are some basic examples that everybody will understand. C major to D minor. <laughs> major E minor. In the 19th century that device was as well used to modulate from minor to a major key and especially that flattened 6th degree turned into a downright romantic cliché. This time I'm gonna animate the chords to generate a little bit more of a romantic vibe. That sounds familiar, right? Because I borrowed it from Schumann. The other example by Mozart that I wanted to show you is to put it mildly, fairly advanced and once more shows how Wolfgang, when he just wanted to, could raise the level of complexity and drama to the highest degrees. Among the many highlights of his infamous C minor fantasy is an animated dance chromatic passage that when you hear it for the first time seems pretty spectacular. Let's give it a shot. I'm sure this didn't just go above the emperor's head. A good part of this crazy passage can be broken down into a sequence of chained up 6-5 modules with a half diminished 7th chord leading into a dominant 7th resolving into a minor 6-4, forming a procedure which he reiterates always a whole tone lower and thus creates an entire chromatic scale in the bass. Listen again with just the chords shown.
didn't get it, I probably wouldn't have been able to do so neither. But anyway, this passage inspired me to construct my own chromatic sequences, just like the one you've seen in the intro. Most of it is just drawn from that little module. Let's go back to the actual modulation pattern. This is just like in the very first Schumann example, a modulation from a major key center to its second degree, which is a minor key. So I try to internalize this particular situation by transposition and by applying different textures to it that I can play around with. The shown example is some sort of a slim nocturne-like texture, with a clear melody in the upper voice and in the left hand an accompaniment in larger arpeggios. Chords first. and texture applied. And then I start trying to jam on it and to build up compound exercises, which means to combine the pattern with other building blocks. This recording captures a little fantasy on this modulation pattern in which I am actually following a very systematic plan of key changes, where I always modulate to the local second degree as you've just seen. And after that I am going to the local 5 that's becoming my new tonic. Then I reiterate the same procedure from the 5. So I am constantly modulating a fifth up. And I hope you recognize that it's pretty much a reminiscence on Schumann's Chopin. With a little more grain of Chopin I'd say. Well guys, I guess that does it for this video. If you like what you've just seen or you want to get your hands on the materials shown in this or other of my videos, consider to support me on Patreon. See you next time. Cheers!